Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's almost noon now. And first of all, as uh, Honorary Secretary of the After Griffith Michael Collins Commemoration Committee, I want to welcome you here today to our ceremonies in this cemetery. In a few moments, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will get our ceremonies on their way. But before we do so, I would like to thank, on behalf of the Collins Griffith Commemoration Society, to thank all of you who attended our Mass earlier in Berkeley Road Church. I would also like to thank the priests, the Christian and altar boys in Berkeley Road for all their help and cooperation. Also, I want to thank our readers in the church, namely Fergus O'Brien and John O'Leary, both of whom are patrons of our society. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say a huge thank you to our singer, Catherine Barton TD, whose singing, I'm sure you would all agree, was absolutely beautiful. I will now hand you over to our chairman, Eddie Nolan, who will conduct the remainder of the ceremonies here today. You're all very, very welcome. First thing I should do, ladies and gentlemen, is apologize uh, our, for Seamus Scully, our PRO, who normally does this MC job that I've got to do, so I'm afraid you're going to have to bear with me uh, for today, at least, anyhow. Um, before we, we, we kick off the uh, ceremonies, uh, just a couple of things that I would like to say. Uh, I'm sure all of you know that um, Michael Collins and Arthur Griffiths both died in August 1922, within a short couple of weeks of each other. And of course, that's the reason why we celebrate, we, we commemorate their deaths here in Glass Devon Cemetery every year jointly. Uh, the first such uh, ceremony was held the following year in um, 1913. Uh, so, the, or sorry, 1923, I should say. So this year, this is the 90th anniversary of that first commemoration ceremony, and um, we're delighted to be able to say, and we we uh, we are almost 100% sure of this, that these ceremonies have been held for those 90 years, unbroken since 1923. And I think it's very important that they continue going forward into the future because I think those of us who were here in the 70s and the 80s will remember that um, the some of the people attending at that time were uh, veterans of the uh, War of Independence and the Civil War. And it was their desire and their fervent hope that these commemorations would continue uh, into the future. And uh, some of us, uh, Carl Boland and some others, we undertook to ensure that that would happen. And we're delighted now to be able to say that we've managed 
to, uh, to keep that going up to this 90th anniversary. And I would hope uh, that any young people here would get involved with our committee to ensure that these ceremonies continue on into the future, because I think each generation owes it to the previous one to make sure that these continue. So hopefully in another 90 years' time, these ceremonies will still be taking place in Glass Nevin Cemetery. Um, and I think talking about Glass Nevin Cemetery, I should compliment and thank uh, George McCullough, the Chief Executive of Glass Nevin Trust, and all the staff here in Glass Nevin Trust for the wonderful, beautiful way that they've presented the graves of um, Pre uh, General Collins and President Griffiths, who is here this morning. They're absolutely beautiful. And we want to thank, thank them very much. And I think a round of applause should be given to them. We will now commence the ceremonies. And uh, the first thing I want to do is to invite Councillor Terry Smith, who is the Cahirlock of Dunleary Ragdown County Council. And Terry has very kindly uh, taken time to be with us today. And I would like to invite Terry to place a wreath at the grave of General Mighty Collins. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, the next thing I would like to do is to invite Geraldine Dalton, who you may know is a close relative of Michael Collins, and invite Geraldine to lead us in the decade of the Rosary. Our Nahar she had the 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 she had a wear it along the cross to talk to you in a lap, the spandy who with the north, the spandy a third previous. She had a wear it along the cross to talk to you in a lap, the spandy who with the north, the spandy a third previous. She had a wear it along the cross to talk to you in a lap, the spandy who with the north, the spandy a third previous. She had a wear it along the cross to turn to the lap, the spandy with the nose, the spandy had turned the brilliant. She had a wear it along the cross to turn to the lap, the spandy with the nose, the spandy had turned the brilliant. She had a wear it along the cross to turn to the lap, the spandy with the nose, the spandy had turned the brilliant. Very much, good, Geraldine. Thank you very, very much, um, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes the ceremony at um, Michael Collins' grave. We will now proceed to the graves of um, uh, Arthur Griffith and David Duggan.
it's a great pleasure to us to be able to say that today we have with us the granddaughter, Nora Nolan, the granddaughter of President Arthur Griffith. And Nora is here with her daughter, Emer. And we're delighted they're with us today. And I would now like to invite Emer to place a wreath on the grave of her great grandfather, President Arthur Griffith. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, I, I would now like to invite our patron, John O'Leary, Sean O'Leary, uh, who tells me that he's coming here for 70 years this year. And I would now like to invite John to lay a wreath at the grave of Eamon Duggan just behind us here. But I just say in relation to Eamon Duggan, uh, I'm sure all of you will know that Eamon Duggan was a signatory to the treaty, the, the, the treaty between Ireland and Britain in 1921. Um, now, his grave is, as you know, just here. And it's been an unmarked grave for, uh, I think he died in 1936. So um, about 10 years ago, we put a small crucifix on the grave just to give, have some recognition there. Um, I think it's an awful pity uh, that there isn't some sort of a, a headstone uh, there to, um, uh, to recognize uh, a signatory to such an important treaty. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, we don't have the funds uh, to undertake a job like that. We don't believe he has any living relatives, but we would hope that maybe our politicians might be able to help us through the Board of Works or some... Um, uh, organization like that assisting us are doing it independently to erect a headstone that would give recognition to Eamon Duggan uh, who as I say was a signatory to such an important treaty. Um, okay, uh, at the, uh, I would now like to call on Geraldine Dalton once again to lead us in a decade of the rosary in memory of Arthur Griffith and Eamon Duggan. Geraldine. Uh, 
Um, at this stage, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to, uh, uh, perhaps should have done it earlier, I just want to, to acknowledge uh, the presence here today of some relatives and descendants of the people whose deaths we are commemorating. Um, Nora Owen is here. Uh, I know Nora, as you know, the close relative of uh, General Michael Collins. I also want to acknowledge the presence of um, uh, Dr. Rich Darwin uh, the son of former Minister for Defence and former leader of Fine Gael. We uh, move on uh, to the next uh, stage in the commemoration ceremonies. And uh, I have to say to you, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you to Dr. Mel Farrell, who uh, will, be making, will be given the oration here today for us. Now, uh, Dr. Mel is a postdoctoral fellow on the Landed Estates of Ireland project run in partnership by the Centre for the Study of Historic Irish Homes and Estates, the Department of History, NUI Maynooth, and the National Library of Ireland. He has also lectured at NUI Maynooth and previously worked as a research assistant on the IRCHSS-sponsored Define the Wind of Change project, 2011-2012. Uh, in September 2012, Mel was confirmed with a PhD for a disserta dissertation titled Few supporters and no organization. Guess who that refers to? Coming here, organization and policy, 1923 to 1933. His PhD was supported by the Government of Ireland Irish Research Council Scholarship. He has published three papers on the organisation of the Common Gael Party and is currently working towards the publication of other aspects of his research. Ladies and gentlemen, could you put your hands together and welcome Dr. Mel much for that generous introduction and indeed let me take this opportunity to thank the Griffith Collins Committee for inviting me to give this the 90th commemorative oration to two giants of Irish history, President Arthur Griffith and General Michael Collins. Both of these men will forever be remembered as two of the leading architects of an independent Ireland. And over the past 90 years, their story has been a source of inspiration to many people, both within Ireland and further afield. On a personal level, today is indeed a very proud day for me. And I consider it a tremendous honor, as would any Irish person, to stand here in Glasnevin, 91 years on, in the traumatic events of August 1922, when in the space of 10 days, the fledgling Irish Free State lost the two men to whom those who supported the treaty had looked for leadership. And at the outset, I feel it is important to note that Griffith and Collins are two figures who both during their own time and again in ours were widely admired across the political spectrum. During the final hours of the negotiations that would culminate in the signing of what would become known as the Anglo-Irish Treaty, Griffith declared in front of both delegations that he was prepared to sign the document as it then stood, even if the other members of the Irish team refused. Griffith's convictions were such that he was willing to face the consequences of returning to Ireland as the sole signatory of a treaty that the rest of the Irish delegation found unacceptable. This incident prompted F.E. Smith, the Earl of Birkenhead, one of the leaders of the British team, and himself, of course, a long-time Unionist, to remark, a braver man than Arthur Griffith I've never met. Also, John Dillon, the last leader of the Home Rule Party, believed that his former opponents, Griffith and Collins, had acted with great courage in 1922 and urged people to support the provisional government. 
It is true to say that the reputations of both men suffered somewhat during the long age of de Valera, particularly during the 1940s and 50s, but also in more recent times. During last year's commemoration, Dr. Pat Wallace described as unfair and grossly erroneous the fact that on the centenary of his birth in 1972, Griffith had been described in the doll as a divisive civil war figure. This in spite of the fact that Griffith's economic teachings formed the basis of the protectionist policies pursued by successive governments. However, neglect of the memory of Griffith and Collins reached its nadir in the 1960s. With civil war wounds still fresh, to the fury of the then Fine Gael-led opposition, in 1964, a book called Facts About Ireland was published by the Department of Foreign Affairs. 56,000 copies of this book were circulated, and while it contained much useful information about the country, the historical section was to prove problematic. Quite simply, the book misrepresented the circumstances surrounding the foundation of the state. There was no mention of Griffith or Collins, and no reference either to the three common Long Isle governments led by W.T. Cosgrave. I should mention here that in the ensuing dull debate on the issue, Fianna Fáil TD Dona O'Malley broke ranks to confirm that nothing sinister was, had been intended, and he used his speech to pay a generous tribute to both Collins and Griffith. Collins, it is fair to say, has probably been more widely remembered than Griffith. And in the popular memory, he alone among the pro-treatyites had the type of charisma or cult of personality to match that of de Valera. He was probably also, perhaps, a more widely admired figure, even among his opponents at the height of the Civil War. Anti-treaty IRA leader Tom Barry like Collins, a popular icon of the War of Independence, was imprisoned by the Free State forces at the start of the Civil War. Barry famously recalled that on the night of the 22nd of August, as news came through that Collins had been killed, he saw close to 1,000 Republican prisoners kneel to recite a rosary the repose of the soul of the Free State Commander-in-Chief. Barry said of the incident, at one time, he had been their leader against the British. Now he was the commander-in-chief of the enemy forces. And of course, Barry himself would later unveil a monument to Collins in 1966 in what was an important act of civil war reconciliation. In our own time, of course, Fianna Fáil, historically the anti-treaty party, and even Sinn Féin will both also speak highly of Collins. We all know that Brian Lennon, the late Brian Lennon, became the first Fianna Fáil figure to deliver the annual Bale of Law commemoration in 2010. Collins today has become something of a national icon, his image a symbol of Irish independence. <clears throat> I have built my own contribution today around the theme Griffith the teacher, Collins the leader. This is an idea that I have borrowed from Liam de Rushta, a supporter of the treaty and personal friend of the two men whom we are commemorating today. De Rushta had been involved in advanced nationalist politics from the early 1900s, and in the 1920s, he was a leading member of Common Long Isle. On the 14th of July, 1927, four days after the assassination of Kevin O'Higgins, De Rosta wrote, Griffith was a teacher, Collins a leader, O'Higgins a state builder. I think this description encapsulates both the relationship between these men and the way in which their supporters came to regard them. Born in 1872, Griffith was 18 years Collins's senior, and of the seven member Sinn Féin cabinet, 
Griffith was the oldest member, Collins the youngest. If Griffith was a reflective, thoughtful man who dedicated 25 years of his life to journalism and the pursuit of a political formula that could lead to an independent Ireland, Collins, by contrast, was the energetic, dynamic young man whose meteoric rise between 1916 and 1922 came to personify the Irish Revolution. Collins was a bright child who, as he grew up in West Cork, quickly imbibed a strong sense of Irish nationalism from James Santry, the local blacksmith, and Dennis Lyons, headmaster of Lissavard National School. During the decade in which he grew up, Irish nationalist politics was marked by paralysis after the fall of Purnell, that generation's lost leader. For 10 years after Parnell's demise, the Home Rule Party was split between various factions and the younger generation found an outlet through the newly established cultural organisations, the Gaelic League and the Gaelic Athletic Association. It was in the context of this paralysis that Griffith founded Sinn Féin in 1905. He hoped that the new party could act as a bridge between the moderates of the Home Rule Party and the physical force tradition represented by the IRB. In this regard, Griffith was the founder of a political movement to which, a century on, three of the four main parties in the Dáil today can still trace their origins. Griffith, in his writings and speeches, argued that Ireland should try to achieve its independence by adopting the same strategy that had freed the Hungarians from Austrian rule in 1867. While Griffith remained on the fringes of Irish politics for some time, his ideas, as expressed in his newspapers, did inspire a younger generation. Poignantly, given the circumstances that would later bring them together, at the age of 14, the young Collins himself wrote, in Arthur Griffith, there is a mighty force in Ireland. He has none of the wildness of some I could name. Instead, there is an abundance of wisdom and an awareness of things which are Ireland. And this would have been written in 1905, the same year that Griffith launched Sinn Féin. I think it is fitting in a year in which London have distinguished themselves in the All-Ireland Championships and when so many of our friends and loved ones are abroad, that we should recall that Collins himself was in exile for 10 years. Aged 15, he took the post office exam and soon found employment with the Royal Mail. Although London was then at the heart of the greatest empire the world had ever seen, Collins immersed himself in the business of the Gerald GAA Club which was based in the Notting Hill area of London. With the club, Collins displayed some of those traits that would mark him out as a leader. Aged 17, he was appointed a club auditor and a year later became vice captain of the hurling team. Within two years, Collins was elected club secretary and subsequently as its delegate to the London County Board. <coughs> It was through his involvement with the London County Board that Collins was first introduced to Sam Maguire, its chairman. In 1909, Maguire recruited Collins to the IRB. By this stage, he was already an active member of, Sh of the London branch of Sinn Féin. And the older members used to uh, appreciate the, the youthful energy that Collins brought to the branch meetings. In 1916, Collins returned to Ireland to participate in the planned rebellion. Soon after the outbreak of the Great War in the autumn of 1914, the IRB's military council had resolved to stage an insurrection while the British were entangled on the continent. Pierce and the other leaders believed, as they saw it, that Ireland's tarnished national honour could be salvaged through an act of rebellion. While others gloried in blood sacrifice, 
Collins, who of course fought in the GPO, believed that the rebels had made themselves a sitting target for superior British forces. For Collins, blood sacrifice was not enough. And after 1916, as he and other professional revolutionaries, such as Harry Boland and Richard Mulcahy, came to the fore, they resolved to adopt guerrilla tactics that would maximise effectiveness against superior forces. After his release from prison at Christmas 1916, Collins's rise to the ranks was rapid. With other, with other veterans of Easter Week, he threw himself into the reorganisation of Sinn Féin. At its Ardèche in October 1917, Griffith, in a humble gesture, agreed to step aside as leader of the party that he had founded, so that de Valera, as the most senior survivor of the rebellion, would take over. Collins and Griffith were subsequently elected to the party's governing executive, and two days later, Collins became the Irish Volunteers Director of Organisation. Capitalising on the new mood which swept the country after the execution of the leaders of 1916, Sinn Féin soon became a mass movement, and a series of by-election victories in 1917 and 1918 so that the Home Rulers no longer spoke for Nationalist Ireland. The sea change in opinion was confirmed at the December 1918 British general election as Sinn Féin won 73 to 106 Irish seats. <coughs> Successful Sinn Féin candidates carried out Arthur Griffith's long-standing policy of abstention from Westminster and instead met as the first doll on the 21st of January 1919. Both Collins and Griffith served in de Valera's doll cabinet as ministers for finance and home affairs respectively. The British soon proscribed the doll and in the two and a half year guerrilla war that followed, Collins became the driving force of the revolution, adding president of the IRB to his list of duties in the summer of 1919. Even though he was the most wanted man in the British Empire, Collins succeeded in setting up an underground Department of Finance, which managed to raise a national loan of close to half a million pounds. By the summer of 1921, the War of Independence had reached a stalemate. While the British controlled the towns, the IRA campaign had made large parts of the countryside impossible to govern. Collins, moreover, was winning the intelligence war in Dublin. When the truce came in July, it was welcomed by all sides, and particularly by a war-weary public. And of course, the, uh, the British policy of reprisals touched on the, the, Collins, the Collins family homestead in, in West Cork as well. The Dáil endorsed de Valera's selection of a six-member Sinn Féin delegation which included three cabinet ministers, Collins, Griffith and Robert Barton, to negotiate a settlement with the British. <coughs> Two months of intense negotiations followed. And let us briefly consider the men with whom Collins and his childhood hero Griffith were negotiating. David Lloyd George, the Welsh wizard, a decade older than Griffith, had just led the British people to victory in the Great War. Austin Chamberlain and Birkenhead, both born in the same year as Griffith, were experienced British statesmen who were engrossed in the politics of empire. Winston Churchill, by that stage, was already a seasoned politician, even if his finest hour was to come 20 years later, leading Britain through the war with Hitler. Collins was, therefore, by some distance, the youngest member of either the Irish or the British delegation. When on the 8th of December 1921, Griffith and Collins returned to Dublin to secure cabinet support for the, agree for the agreement that they had struck in London, they found that de Valera was opposed, believing that the delegation had exceeded their instructions. Cahill Brua and Austin Stack, representing hardline Republican opinion, were also opposed. Crucially, W.T. Cosgrave joined with the three signatories, 
to ensure that the cabinet voted by a majority of one to recommend the treaty to Dáil Éireann. In the impressive Dáil debate on the treaty that followed, Sinn Féin deputies discussed their country's history, conditions in the post-war world and the principles of democracy. <clears throat> and we should remember that from these honest debates, the new state emerged and also its parties and their ideologies. Griffith, as chairman of the delegation, opened by proposing the motion that Dáil Éireann approve the treaty between Great Britain and Ireland signed in London on the 6th of December 1921. The motion was seconded by Sean McKeown, who of course had commanded the North Longford Flying Column during the War of Independence. And I just want to mention here that in July, a monument to Sean McKeown was unveiled in his hometown of Banalee in North Longford. The star of the show, however, was Collins. When the Dáil reconvened after lunch at 3.45 p.m. on the 19th of December, Collins rose to deliver a speech which the late Peter Hart has described as one of the great statements of political rationality in Irish history. Rejecting Republican accusations that neither the dead or the generations as yet unborn would approve of the treaty, Collins said, there is no man here who has more regard for the dead men than I have. I don't think it is fair to be quoting them against us. I think our decision ought to be a clear decision on the documents as they are before us, on the treaty as it is before us. On that we shall be judged as to whether we have done the right thing in our own conscience or not. Under the headline, Collins dominates session, the New York Times gushed that Collins was, quote, beyond question, the outstanding figure in the doll. On the 7th of January, 1922, the doll approved of the treaty by 64 votes to 57. A week later, on the 14th of January, a provisional government was established and at its inaugural meeting, two days later, Collins was elected chairman. Collins continued to grow in stature and influence during the first half of 1922. His charismatic personality and the strong reputation that he had built up in the years since 1916 helped to convince many skeptics that the treaty, that the treaty was a good deal. More ominously, however, in April, the anti-treaty IRA began to occupy buildings and were soon jostling with the new Free State Army for control of military barracks being vacated by the departing British. With the general election in June, there was considerable tension in the air in the spring and summer of 1922. Political meetings frequently ended in violence. Such was the threat that Griffith, before leaving to address a pro-treaty meeting in Sligo, sealed instructions in an envelope which was to be opened should he not return. The June election, however, was a victory for Collins and Griffith. 58 pro-treaty Sinn Féin candidates were elected, as opposed to 36 for the anti-treatyites. However, there still remained the problem of the anti-treaty IRA. While the government was reluctant to move against former colleagues, the occupation of such buildings as the forecourts could not be tolerated indefinitely. Indeed, there were well-grounded fears within the government circles that failure to dislodge the anti-treatyites would lead to a return of the British. Collins delayed for as long as possible before the Free State Army finally moved against the Four Courts garrison at 4am on the 28th of June 1922. It was tragic that the United Front achieved in 1917 should end with Irish nationalists <coughs> fighting each other. Arthur Griffith found the stress too great and his health rapidly deteriorated before he was hospitalised 
at the beginning of August. On the 12th of July, Collins resigned temporarily from his position at the head of the provisional government to take charge of the military effort as the first commander-in-chief of the Irish Free State Army. He was replaced on a temporary basis by W.T. Cosgrove. In July and August, it seemed as though civil war was almost won for the Free State side. After intense fighting, the government had quickly taken control of Dublin, while Limerick and Waterford soon fell. In addition, the plan to land Free State troops in Cork by sea took the anti-treaty forces there by surprise, forcing them out of the city on the 10th of August. Meanwhile, doctors at St Vincent's became increasingly concerned for Griffith's health. They observed what they believed to be signs of hemorrhage. However, they found it impossible to keep Griffith quiet, and he insisted on returning to his desk at government buildings. Shortly before 10 a.m. on the morning of the 12th of August, Griffith fell unconscious as he stooped to tie his shoelaces. He died soon after. He was found with just one penny in his pocket, as Dr. Wallace remarked last year, a tribute to a lifetime of selfless dedication to public service. Much of the city still lay in ruins on the 16th of August as Griffith's funeral cortege passed the Dublin crowds on its way to Glasnevin. For the provisional government, Griffith's funeral was a show of defiance and the procession was carefully choreographed to reflect the Free State's new order. Politicians walked side by side with clergymen, ahead of the military who were led by Collins and Mulcahy. Collins on that day was the heir apparent, and as the historian John Regan has noted, the numerous iconic images of Collins that were captured at Griffith's funeral were to prove among the most powerful and enduring. Collins used the occasion to reject an image of authority and order as the country mourned Griffith. There was work to be done, a state to be built. In one photograph, Collins is seen listening attentively in the background here as Cosgrave delivered the funeral oration to Griffith. And I wonder what kind of relationship may have developed between the two at Collins lived. But Collins' ascendancy will be cut tragically short just six days later. On the 22nd of August, as he led a free state tour of inspection in the same West Cork where he had first imbibed that sense of Irish nationalism which had thrust him onto the national stage, an ambush was prepared at the of law. Perhaps the adrenaline of combat resulted in his countering Emma Dalton's order to drive like hell by shouting, stop, and we'll fight them. During the course of an engagement that lasted for some 25 minutes, Collins received a fatal shot to the head and died instantly. His death, coming so soon after the passing of Arthur Griffith, was a devastating blow to the provisional government, depriving it of a rich bank of talent, energy and leadership. Chairman, your committee organises this event each year to honour the memory of Griffith and Collins. They signed a treaty which is the foundation stone upon which the Irish state is built. And while in the 91 years since that state has not been without its blemishes, it has on the whole been a force for peace and reconciliation in the world and a consistent critic of repressive regimes. In fact, when we reflect upon a 20th century that brought the spectre of dictatorship and wars of annihilation to the heart of the continent, we should remember that quite remarkably the young Irish state formed less than a century ago is one of just five European states that can boast elected governments from 1922 until the, the current day continuously.
of course the others being Finland, Britain, Sweden and Switzerland. No wonder then that Griffith and Collins are remembered by freedom-loving people across the world. We should remember though that they were part of a young generation which had a vision for Ireland and succeeded in implementing it. To truly honour the memory of Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins, we should be mindful of the need to give space to both new ideas and the younger generation as we seek answers to the challenges that face us. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, before we disband, there's just a few other things I want to do. First of all, I want to say some thank yous to people who have helped to make uh, these commemoration ceremonies a success here this morning or this afternoon. First of all, uh, on my own behalf in particular, I want to thank Eamon Lord and Peter Gaffney, who... Uh, uh, I also want to thank um, Marisha and Louise Cosgrave for the fantastic work that they've done, uh, not just in the last week or two, but throughout the past year, and all the help that they've given me. I also want to thank Anne Desmond, who is secretary to Pascal Donoghue, who helped us so much during, um, during the year, sending out nurses and uh, doing a lot of secretary work for us. Also, of course, I want to thank Pat, uh, Pat uh, Hines here, um, our honorary secretary, uh, for the great work that he's done since becoming secretary. I um, also want to thank uh, Geraldine Dalton um, for um, uh, leading us in the Decades of the Rosary here this morning, which she has done over a long, long number of years, and I want to thank her for that. Our piper, uh, Sean Clare, I want to thank Sean very much uh, for being with us here today. Oh, no. 